Alright, in this video I'm going over the difference between adverse selection and moral hazard, and these are often discussed together, and there's good reason for that. One reason is oftentimes they happen together, like the same type of contract will be associated with both adverse selection and moral hazard. They also have some things in common, so they're both about asymmetric information, um, they both are about a bias that happens, and they're both about entering into a contract. So the difference is, um, with adverse selection, the, asy aim the, the asymmetric information is about the type of person who's attracted to a particular type of contract. And um, so, definitionally, adverse selection is where asymmetric information about the type of person attracted to a contract causes a bias before entering into the contract. So when, um, when the parties sign on the dotted line for the contract, the bias has already happened because of the type of person attracted to it. And so this is another way of thinking about adverse selection. It has to do with the type of person attracted to the contract. On the other hand, moral hazard is asymmetric information about the behavior um, of people who are entering into a contract and that, that behavior that's caused by that causes a bias after entering into the contract. So um, moral hazard is really about the incentives created by the contract and the bias that happened because those incentives play out after people are under the contract. So let's go through a few examples and of course if we're talking about a contract we need to be thinking about what type of contract and I'll go through a bunch of examples but let's start with health insurance. Okay, so we have health insurance contracts, and of course, there's a lot of things associated with health insurance contract, the network of doctors, um, which procedures are covered, which procedures are not covered, but one of the most basic things about a health insurance contract is what is the copay? How much do you have to pay if you go into the doctor? Do you have to pay 100% of the costs, or 50% of the costs, or, or 0%? And a classic copay might be 20% or 30% is the responsibility of the patient, um, but you could have higher quality health insurance where the patient pays 0%. So let's imagine a low copay, like 0% copay, you can go to the doctor for free whenever you want, versus a high copay contract. Now of course if you have a high pay copay contract, um, that means that the insurance itself, the premium you pay for the insurance, can be cheaper. So if we're thinking about adverse selection, this is going to be about what type of person is attracted to each of these types of contracts. And as you might imagine, the low po copay contract is going to be attractive to people who go to the doctor a lot. If you expect to go 12 times this year to the doctor, um, you're more likely to choose the plan with a zero copay every time you go. Whereas if you only plan to go once or not at all to the doctor, you might be okay with a higher copay, a $20 or $30 copay, if the price of that insurance is cheaper. So because of that, there's going to be different types of people that select into these contracts. As a matter of fact, sick people are more likely to select into the high quality health insurance, the low co copay insurance, and healthy people are more likely to select into the high quality health insurance. Now, the fact that healthy people do select into this high quality health insurance means that um, there's actually going to be a lot fewer costs to the health insurance company, so it will actually be able to, um, they'll actually be able to reduce the cost of that health insurance company. So this can actually be even cheaper than it would be if people selected randomly into these plans, just because the cheap people to insure end up buying this low quality health insurance, so it gets even cheaper. And the reverse is true for the high quality health insurance with a low copayment. Because sick people select into that plan, it's more costly to insure them because they go to the doctor a lot and the insurer will have to pay for more. And that leads to um, the insurance companies needing to raise the price of the insurance. So the high quality insurance ends up being more expensive than it would be if people selected randomly into these plans. And that's adverse selection at play. Now, health insurance also has a moral hazard effect. Um, so if we think about the incentives that are at play based on the copayment, um, 
Are you going to get the name brand drugs or are you going to get the generic drugs? Well, if you have a 0% copay, you might as well get the name brand drugs. So um, the copay is something that's going to incentivize watchful behavior in terms of what kinds of things you buy. And that's going to, in turn, affect the, the price of the product. So if, you, if people are incentivized to um, always take the most expensive option, always take the... Uh, always take the name brand drug, always take the, uh, the fancy treatment as opposed to watching your, your every penny, then that's going to also drive up the price of health insurance. So the copay will lead to different types of behavior based on that contract. So there we go, the, the type of insurance contract is going to lead to certain behaviors based on the incentives in that contract, based on the copayments, and that's actually going to, to influence the quality of the product or the price of the product in this case. So both of these factors are going to influence price. As a matter of fact, both factors will drive up the price, the insurance premium for low copay insurance, and will drive down the insurance premium for high copay insurance. Let's look at a different example now. Actually, let's go over a couple of classic examples that actually don't match up between the two. Um, the classic example of adverse selection is the lemon market for cars. So in the market for used cars, in the used car market, the type of person that's attracted to sell their car on the used car market is someone who probably has a car that they're no longer that happy with. Maybe that's because there's something wrong with the car or because they expect it to break down soon or because they're annoyed with some feature of the car. There's a lot of reasons you might want to bring your car to the used car market and many of those are bad reasons. So if the contract is um, the sign the dotted line at the used car lot, the type of person attracted to sell their car on that, that market is going to have be biased in the direction of having cars that are just about to break down or that have some other annoying feature to them. So that's an example of adverse selection. It's a classic example. An example of moral hazard is 10 friends going out to eat and splitting the bill. So if the contract is the 10 friends coming to an agreement at the beginning of the meal that they'll all just split the meal equally, then that incentivizes certain types of behavior. As a matter of fact, it incentivizes you to order dessert, to order the expensive dish, um, to order a few drinks with your meal. And that incentive is created by the contract, the verbal contract that all 10 friends have agreed to. And because of that behavior incentive, it influences the experience or the product. It drives up the price of the meal because people behave in a way that's responding to the incentives at play. So that's moral hazard and adverse selection. Let's go through a couple more examples where these sides match up. So if the contract is renting of a house, we're going to have both moral hazard and adverse selection at play. So if you're just not in the stage of life where you really have time to care for a home or have time to um, really invest in cleaning your house and doing the, the regular upkeep, you're more likely to be attracted to renting the house. And if you're a naturally messy person who doesn't really want to take care of things and maybe is fine destroying things or doesn't want to think about that, you're more likely to rent than you are to buy. So the type of person who shows up to a rental is a different type of person on average than someone who shows up to buy a house. Um, if you show up to buy a house, you're more likely to be someone who's interested in caring for the product. And of course, there's also the incentive after you enter into the contract, the contract itself creates incentives. The fact that um, you can leave anytime you want, you don't have to pay for any damage, that's something that the landlord is responsible for, means that based on the contract, there's less incentives for rental people than for people who own to take care of their home and do a good job with that. So moral hazard and adverse selection are both at play when it comes to housing rentals. Now, of course, societies come up with some solutions to try to address the moral hazard and adverse selection problems. For example, um, your credit score is something that can help this particular situation. Do you pay your bills? Um, are you a risky person for your landlord to take on as a renter? And that credit score acts as a mechanism for for reducing both of these because um, it helps the landlord to sort through the people who show up to make sure um, people have a history of responsible payment 
if they show up, and the fact that the credit score is in place also creates an incentive for people to pay their bills after they rent because they want to keep that good credit score. So that's one solution to both moral hazard and adverse selection that reduces the um, market inefficiencies that happen because of these two concepts. And there are other mechanisms as well. Um, for example, the uh, the deposit you put down on a house when you first start to rent it, you, you put down a thousand or two thousand or one month's rent or three months rent and you don't get it back if you destroy the property. So that's another mechanism in play to try to reduce the moral hazard problem. And it could potentially also um, Ha, ha, have something to do with adverse selection because you need to have saved up for that deposit so that could create um, some small reduction in the adverse selection problem as well. So that's adverse selection and moral hazard. Um, really the difference is adverse selection is about the type of person attracted to a contract. Moral hazard is about their behavior based on the incentives in the contract and both of those things create a bias in the actual product that the contract is meant to um, enact in the world.